Today I'm going to uh, just start a brand new series. Is that good? And uh, God put it on my heart. I mentioned this last week, but I'm going to make a new series out of this. Harnessing your mind. How many know your mind determines where you go in life? So let's talk about this a little bit. The mind is under tremendous assault today. And you know, I've noticed that Oh, it's been in vogue for many years now. Uh, people are into physical exercise and you got exercise places and workout places that have cropped up in all the communities all around us. If you're driving and tooling around whatever town you're in, you always see little exercise places. And, you know, we've got great trails and parks and places here. You know, I exercise on the Noose River Trail well, on my bicycle. You know, we, we, we've, uh, we've recognized the importance of staying active lifelong, right? And we, we as a culture have learned to value that. And then, uh, then another thing, we have learned that if you want to live a long, productive life, eat right. And so, uh, you know, online all the time, there are articles galore on eating properly, staying away from junk food, eating things that have the essential nutrients in them, yada, yada, yada. And that's become popularized and, and all that. How many know that is, is important? But it's funny that we can exercise our bodies and we want to keep them in shape and then we can watch what we eat. But you know what we don't do well as a culture? We don't watch what we think well. It's funny that, you know, you might not go to McDonald's or Burger King to eat, or maybe you do. Or you, won't, you don't eat a lot of fast food or junk food, but, you know, you'll put junk in your thoughts. And that's the way our culture is right now. God wants to change that. The mind is under tremendous assault today. I wrote this down. Our spiritual life will be no stronger than our thought life. You ever thought about that? So how are you doing thinking-wise? How's your thoughts? How's your mind? Um... The truth is, if you do it right, believers, and I've said this for years, believers ought to have the strongest minds and most stable emotions of anybody in culture. What do you think? Often, that's not the case. In fact, some believers are more unstable than many people in culture because their minds have not yet been, been introduced to what Jesus has done in their hearts. But again, if you do it right, and you get the Word inside of you in the way that it should be, and be a doer of it, not just listen to it, but put it into practice, it'll stabilize your thought life. It'll stabilize your emotions. I know as an 18-year-old, when I first came to Jesus, my, I was a roller coaster person. I was up one day and down the next, and you know, I never knew where I would land uh, each day as I woke up. I was hoping every day I'd have a good day, but wasn't always that way. When I came to Jesus and found out that as goes my mind, so goes my life. I begin to put value in, in training my thoughts. And we're going to talk about mind renewal. We're going to talk about some things that will help us harness our thoughts. How many know Satan has one way to get into the life, the life of a human being? And that one way is the thoughts. How many hear what I'm saying? So uh, let me go through a, just a little trail here, run a rabbit trail about that, what I just said. Uh, our invisible enemy, Satan, the Bible says, uh, he's always looking to make inroads into human life. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, This Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. Don't let that upset you when it says Satan, who is God. That's a little g, have you noticed? That's the wrong verse. There it is. Satan, who is God of this world, Satan has a legal right to be on planet earth. Because of Adam and Eve's sin, Satan has a legal right to be here. When Adam chose to disobey God, Adam being the first man and Eve his wife, when they chose to disobey what God specifically said to them, it opened a door for God's arch enemy through the eons of time. His name is Lucifer, Satan. He's got several names the Bible identifies him by. He gained a, a legal right to oversee things on planet earth, even though God is over all in an overarching way in charge. And the Bible calls him the God of this world. Has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ. Who is the exact likeness of God? So what does this God of this world do? What does Satan do with people's minds? It says here, he's blinded their minds. If your mind is blinded, you can't think straight. You can't see straight. You can't reason 
properly. And he says he blinds the minds of those who don't believe. What do you think he does to the minds of those that do believe? He tries to get you off on a different path than you should be on. He's constantly assaulting the thought patterns. You go back to 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter's uh, epistle to the church. And verse 7 is a familiar passage where it says, Casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Well, there's some insight, that's an insightful verse there. Casting all your care. Everybody say care. And then he's used the care, word care two times. Don't let that, uh, don't let that, uh, don't misunderstand what he's saying. Casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. It's not the same words, different word I'll show you in a minute. Casting all your care. That word care uh, could be translated distractions. In fact, in Mark chapter 4, where uh, Jesus was given the parable of the sower. You got four kinds of heart soils that God's word was planted on by, by those that minister his word. Wayside, stony, thorny, and good. And the thorny soil, what are thorns? Well, they grow up out of the soil and they choke the good, the, the good uh, plants that are growing. He said the cares of this world deceitfulness of, of money and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word, the cares of this world, the distractions of the world, the distractions of the age. That word cares there, casting all your cares, casting all your distractive thoughts upon him. How many have been distracted by your thoughts lately? Probably when you got up this morning, you, get, you can think about your job. You can think about, oh, I got to meet family I haven't talked to in a long time this week. Or I got to prepare for a long trip. Or I got all this stuff to do for Thanksgiving. I got to go to the grocery store, try to beat the crowd, yada, yada. And, and then you're thinking about all kinds of things in all kinds of veins of life. And how many know it can cause worry? So he says, casting all your cares, those, those thoughts that can distract you from the best that life has, casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. That verse is not saying, give all these worrying thoughts, distractive thoughts to God because he'll be distracted and will worry for you. That's not what it's saying. Even though it's the word care. That's another word for care. And it's a word that means that he loves us and he wants to assume the responsibility for all of the challenges that we face and he wants to help us work them out. Yes or no? Then 1 Peter chapter 5 verse uh, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's a really interesting uh, passage. Verse 8 says, Be sober. So when you think about sobriety, what's the first thing you think about? Someone who's an alcoholic or, or a person that gets drunk and he's encouraging a person, be sober. But this is not talking about natural alcohol. In fact, the word here for sober, be sober, it's the Greek word that gives reference to the human mind. It literally could be translated, be free from mental intoxicants. How many have ever been mentally intoxicated? A lot. What happens when you're mentally intoxicated? Well, what, what, what happens to a person that, that imbibs alcohol? What happens to their physical body? They go places they wouldn't normally go. They say things they wouldn't normally say. And they act out of character. Yes or no? A person who's drunk. In fact, you know, when I take these long haul flights to other nations, I've been to India and Africa quite a few times and uh, usually on the, it's just crazy how it works out. Usually on the long haul flight, some reason, somebody going to sit beside me that just loves to drink. And I, I, here's what I think. Here I go again. Here I go again, you know. And so they'll start drinking and they're fine. Well, I start down. I, they sit down. We shake hands and, you know, get through the, you know, little howdy do's and stuff. And, and so I'm doing my stuff. I'm reading and all that. They're, they're drinking, you know. And, and finally they get really happy. And they start saying things they wouldn't normally say, y'all. I mean. And then when they find out I'm a preacher, oh man, it's like, Father. And then they just say things they would never ever say and act in unbecoming ways. And finally, finally, you probably had this experience, the, the uh, waitress, uh, the um, stewardess or steward will come by and say, well, no more drinking for you, right? Wow, they're acting already acting out of character and they're already lit. So you think about a person... So you think about a person who's drunk physically, they act in ways they wouldn't normally act. Yes or no? Yes. Now think about me and you. When thoughts come that distract us, huh? Thoughts that come that, 
you know, kind of waylay us and we, we seem to be doing fine in life. And all this got to happen is one phone call is made. You open one email, you get one text, and your day that was wonderful suddenly goes south. You ever had that happen? Now, that's mental intoxication. So the potential is every day we could live a mentally intoxicated life. And if you live a mentally intoxicated life, let me say that we will never obtain the best that God has for us if we allow the enemy to intoxicate our thoughts. So he says, be mentally self-controlled. Then he says, be vigilant. That is, be ever on your guard. It could be literally translated, be guarded. Watch how? Watch what you think. Why? Because your adversary, the devil. How many know the devil is real? You can't see him. Let me say he's not the guy on the little ham can, you know, with the, with the pitchfork and the tail and the little, you know, the little horns and stuff. The Underwood devil can, ham can. Y'all still eat that stuff? No? Nobody eats that? Is that old school? Do they even sell it now? Well, see, I used to work on a meat aisle in a grocery store when I was 16 years old. And my job was to take the Underwood deviled ham cans out of the box and stick them on the shelf. And I kept looking at that little devil on that can. And you know what I found out? He's not like that devil on the can. The devil is wily. You can't see him. You don't even know he's there. He works by subterfuge underneath the service. Nobody sees him. He's like the mob boss that, that rules the undercurrent of crime in any major city. He's never seen or heard from, but everybody knows he's around somewhere because you see what he's doing. Now that's the devil. He says, because your adversary, the devil, walks about seeking whom he may devour. And so again, notice it says he's like a roaring lion, but he's not a roaring lion. He just acts like he's got a big roar, but he has no bite. How many hear me? And I've got stories about that I don't have time to tell right now. But just understand that we have an enemy, an adversary, And the major way he attacks us is through our thought life. Let me carry this thought a little bit further. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11. So Satan will not outsmart us for we are familiar with his evil schemes. New Living Translation. King James Translation of the Bible says we are not ignorant of his devices. Um, And so this word schemes or devices, we are not ignorant of his schemes one of my friends rick renner translates it this way he knows greek really well and he has translated this verse we're not ignorant of his of his mind games one translation says we're not ignorant of this of his schemings of the mind this word this word here schemes is actually the again the greek word for mind And it's talking about the fact that we should not allow Satan to outsmart us because we know when he comes, he comes to hinder our thought processes first. The next thing I want to share with you is, and I've shared this so many times, just a few weeks ago on Wednesday night I shared this, but I need to do it again on Sunday morning. When Satan comes, he comes down one path or one road into every human life, and his path or road is through the road of thoughts. And we find that in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, where we've read, it's for me to many who have known the Lord for a while, Ephesians 6, 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wilds of the devil. That's New King James or King James. You don't use the word wilds today. Uh, And when I think about the word wilds, my mind goes back to Looney Tunes cartoons. Because you got Wiley E. Coyote. How many remember Wiley E.? How many like Wiley? I I just like watching that dude. He's always making a fool of himself. He's always trying to, you know, grab the roadrunner and eat him for lunch. But he never can quite get his hands on him. Because all of his schemes turn on himself, right? So Wiley E. And so he says... uh, that you may be able to stand against the wilds of the devil. And it's more appropriate to call it Wiley E. Cody than you may realize. This word wild, stratagems, strategies, methods, all those words could be translated. Actually, the Greek word here gives reference to a road. The Greek word actually comes from an English word that we use all the time. When you get in your car started up, you have an odometer, and it tells you the mileage of your of automobile. Well, that comes from that, that word because odometer has to do with the road. 
Odos has to do with a path, a road. And so odometer is how far we've gone down the road. But oidos, the Greek word here, it literally means a path, a road, a way of traveling. So what is it saying? Listen, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the inroads, the path that Satan uses to come into your life. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts, of wickedness in the heavenly places. And here, uh, uh, Paul delineates the various levels of demon power from lowest to the highest principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual wickedness in high places. There is a, a dark kingdom that uh, actually inhabits the, the atmosphere around our present world. Notice again the earlier scripture where Paul called Satan the God of this age. He has a legal right to be here. When Adam and Eve sinned, they gave Satan power over the atmosphere surrounding the earth. Darkness covered the earth. And, uh, and Satan uses these demon powers, various, uh, various levels of them from the lowest to the highest. And he seeks to dominate human behavior by dominating human thought. How many hear what I'm saying? So worldwide, there is a, there's a cloud canopy of darkness and, there's a, and these dark spirits, though you can't see them, they interject certain kinds of thinking to produce certain kinds of behavior, right? The eventual end of that will be the revelation of a person the Bible calls Antichrist, which he will be against Christianity and against Judaism, and he will seek to wipe any kind of lawfulness from the face of the earth, and anything goes under his tutelage and regime wherever he happens to rule the earth in his time. And he'll, he'll seek to wipe out any, any vestige of Christianity worldwide. Again, it's thoughts. It's thoughts that come. So again, it says here, uh, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the inroads of thought. That Satan comes into your life with. So if you think about the fact that the enemy comes. He comes into our life. He brings distractions. He wants to make us mentally intoxicated. And then he wants to come down a particular road. He wants to scheme with the way that we think. To get us off the path that God has for us. And how many know if it's important to, uh, to uh, exercise your body? I exercise. I believe, in, I believe in exercising a good bit. And the older I get, the more I want to do that. I want to eat properly. It's even more important to watch what you think. Yes or no? So I've got four things to know today about harnessing the mind. I'll be able to get, get done in a, very well, uh, in, a, in a good time and leave you with something. I'm going to leave you with a sheet to take home and think about. Four things to know about harnessing the mind. Now I'm going to go back. Now this is years and years ago. My son worked for me and, and made this little chart. And I hadn't heard anybody talk about this in years and years. But here is spirit, soul, and body. Listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. The apostle Paul said, Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. And then he defined, he defined the human as God sees him. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. The psychologist only sees Two parts to man, God sees three. God adds the spiritual element to man. Uh, we are spirit beings. Say this out loud. I say things out loud because it registers on my heart. I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a body. Now, you know, 40 years ago, I heard this kind of teaching and it revolutionized my life as a, as a, as a teenager in my late teen years. And I put the, uh, if you'll put the... Uh, Think there it is, spirit, soul, and body thing back up there. We're spirit, spirit beings living in physical bodies. In fact, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living person. So when God created our bodies from dirt and then put something of himself into a human being, a spirit nature, like he is, Jesus said in John 40, 24, man, uh, God is spirit. There's no article before spirit. God is spirit. That is, he's a spiritual being. 
And you can see that played out when God created us from dirt, Genesis 2-7. Adam came from dirt and then God breathed into his nostrils the living breath and he became a soul. So the entrance of the spirit into the body created the soul. And so really the way this works, um, I wish this looked a little different. You got spirit, soul, body, spirit is the core, the central, central part of our being. It's the part that God deals with. And then we have soul and body. Really, it would be better for that to be concentric circles, circles that overlap each other because it's not exactly this tidy. You can't really tell sometimes where spirit stops and soul begins. And then sometimes it's hard to differentiate uh, soul from body with the five senses all involved. It's all kind of meshed together. How many know it takes the Bible? In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews 4, the word of God is alive and full of power and it's able to separate soul from spirit. It takes a spiritual understanding to know from whence your thoughts and desires come from. And this is probably an oversimplistic, if you study psychology, or went further and studied psychiatry. This is perhaps an overly simplistic way of looking at human personality. But for our conversation today, I think it helps you to understand the way that God made us. And I want you to think about it in these terms. When God first created Adam and Eve, they were there in the Garden of Eden. He created a beautiful garden with all kinds of trees and fruit. and he, They enjoyed life every day. And and he said, uh, you, can, you can eat of all of the fruit trees, just don't eat of that one in the middle because the day you do, you're going to die. They did that. They died spiritually. So think about it in these terms. When God created Adam and Eve, their spiritual nature, that is their intuition, their conscience, their inner knowing, that gut sense that we all have now, that was at the forefront of their life. Could you imagine Living life where the first thing you thought about when making a decision is what your conscience said. Now, wouldn't that be cool? Or or your intuition when you were thinking about doing something. The first thing that comes up is intuition. Well, I have an inner gut sense that I should do this. Before you think it out, the conscience comes into play. And that's how Adam and Eve lived before they sinned. Then once they sinned, it flipped. And instead of spirit and conscience being at the forefront, intellect, reasoning, thinking, and then emotional feeling and volition came into play. How many hear me? And so that's the reason we have problems that we have today. They've been flipped instead of the spirit nature taking the ascendancy, living, being the first thing that we think about. We think about intellect. We think about feelings. We think about what we want to do. How many hear what I'm saying? So let's look at this real quickly. Our spirit nature is a part of us that relates to God. And I mentioned conscience, intuition, the inner knowing that we have, a gut sense. All of that comes from the spirit nature, and it's deeper than thought. Then we have uh, the soul of man. The Bible talks about the soul of man. When I was a little boy, they were always related in the same way. The soul and the spirit were used interchangeably. My Baptist pastor would say we had so many souls saved in a revival at X period of time. And so we use those terms interchangeable. But the spirit is not the soul, and the soul is not the spirit because they can be divided, according to Hebrews 4.12, we know they're not the same. The soul of man simplistically made up of three parts, intellect, emotion, and will. Mind, emotion, and will make up the soul. And there's a predominant part of the soul. The will is the predominant part of the soul of man. That's the reason after we're saved, we have trouble obeying God because we have a, such a stubborn, obstinate body emotion-centered will. We want to do what we want to do, period, right? That's the reason we struggle so much because the the soul has has fallen and it's not the way God ordained and designed it. I've got this on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, I heard somebody, I think uh, Lester somewhere years and years ago, decades and decades ago, he said it this way, keep your spirit on the level of the king. Well, we don't think about kings today, but in the day that kings ruled and reigned, what does the king do? If you read history, kings gave orders, edicts, and instructions, and they were to be implicitly obeyed. The word of a king brought power. You did what the king said. Yes or no? So keep your spirit on. That, way you're, that means your conscience. Do what your conscience says. 
Don't defy conscience. Secondly, keep your uh, soul on the level of a servant. What does a servant do? A servant obeys given instructions. My mind is supposed to listen to my conscience, not the culture around me. Yes or no? And then keep your body on the level of a slave. What does a slave do? A slave has no will of his own. If body says, you know, eat that fourth piece of coconut cream pie, you say, shut up. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to eat one quarter of a piece and that's it. Etc. So king, servant, slave, spirit, soul, body. That's the way it should work. So our body is our, I call it our earth suit. Astronauts have space suits. We have earth suits. Once you, once you leave your body, you can't live on earth. You've got to go somewhere else. That's just the way it is. So we're to keep our bodies and we're to keep, we're to keep this order the way it should be. When Adam and Eve were first created, his spirit was in harmony with God. His soul, his mind, emotions, his intellect, his, his will flowed with his spiritual relationship with God. And then, and then his body was related to the earth. And it, it, they all flowed in harmony. But sin brought a disharmony to that. Number two, the new birth transforms our spiritual nature how many know we're all fallen the bible says all of us ascend and fall short of god's glorious standards but thank god through the new birth how many know we can be born again what happens in the new birth in the new birth there is deposited uh on the inside of us by the holy spirit the very life and very nature of god that means our interests and desires are changed is that cool that's the reason we read 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Amplified Bible, uh, which amplifies the original languages of Scripture. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, that is grafted in, joined to him by faith in him as Savior, he's a new creature, reborn and renewed by the Holy Spirit. The old things, the previous moral and spiritual condition have passed away. Behold, new things have come uh, because spiritual awakening be- brings new life. Uh, So anybody that's in Christ is a new creation. He's somebody that never existed before on the inside. There are new interests, new desires. That means you want to tell the truth. You want to clean up your lifestyle. It means you want to to do things that are right. You want to treat people with respect and fairness and kindness and love. It's something that comes inside, yes or no? And that's in the new birth. However, just because that happens to us on the inside doesn't mean that every believer lives that way. We can have the life of God inside and it be kind of tucked away and covered because our mind doesn't change. So number three, the mind must be renewed for the spirit to be free. And the reason that some people, though they may have been saved from sin, they don't live as a believer should live. They adopt a lot of the characteristics of the culture around them. It's because their minds don't change. And for what God has done on the inside by the Holy Ghost, for it to, for it to affect us, how many know it's got to affect what we think? Our mind is the, is the pivot point between being a spiritual person ruled by the Lord or being a carnal person ruled by my body and ruled by the culture around me. Yes or no? So the Apostle Paul recognized this challenge and he spoke to the uh, believers in Rome, the people who were saved in Rome, and he said this in Romans 12. He said, I, I beg or beseech or beg you therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And there's a lot here. Just real quickly, he said, I beg you that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. They were living in a, uh, the Jews surrounded them. The Jews offered animal sacrifices to God. And the animal sacrifices that the Jews offered to God were animals that were cleaned and killed and then offered on an altar in sacrifice to the Lord. But he used the paradox here he said he said just like you see those dead animals being offered by the Jews to God he said I want you to offer not a dead sacrifice of a dead animal but a living sacrifice your human body that is don't do what you feel like doing when God says it's wrong how many hear that he said it called it a living sacrifice don't eat that fourth piece of pie You know, don't chew that person out when they did you wrong. Don't beep your horn for, you know, 30 seconds after somebody cuts you off in traffic on 440, right? 
He says, offer a living sacrifice. Listen to your inner person and and say no to the desires of your flesh and unrenewed mind. He said, um, offer your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Weiss translation brings out that this says reasonable service in that you give your body as a living sacrifice when you change how you think about life. Then he says in verse 2, he says, in fact, New Living Translation says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Phillips Translation, so don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Don't be like everybody else just because everybody else is doing it. Doesn't mean that I'm to do it, yes or no? And so he says, don't let the world squeeze you from the outside in, but let God transform you. Everybody say transform. A word transform is a word, uh, if you've been to science class, metamorphosis is a caterpillar to a butterfly. It's a tadpole to a, to a frog, right? And so what is he saying there? There's a change from the inside out. He said here again, don't be conformed by outward pressure to the world, but be transformed from the inside out by the renewing. Everybody say renewing. That is a completely remaking of your mental processes by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Passion's translation says, stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but inwardly be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. As go our thoughts, so go our lives. And that's the reason we're so challenged mentally today because Satan wants to keep every person, saved or unsaved, walking in darkness. So we have, we just have a bilge of thoughts coming constantly and we have to make choices to be in control of our mind and not allow the culture to be in control of our mind. Yes or no? And what I found today is the media controls most people's thoughts. You know, uh, I, I don't care where I am, I can be on the, on the belt line. And you know what people are doing on the belt line traveling now? And you know, they're having wrecks galore. Why? Because something else is occupying their thoughts and occupying their attention other than the things that should be. And whether people are walking in the park, you can see people when you're shopping, shopping, people are constantly on media, are they not? I've even noticed when I ride my bike on the Noose River Trail, I've told you this so many times, I had one guy uh, some time ago, uh, uh, he had his phone out, and he's looking at his phone while he's riding his bike towards me, and I have this new little digital uh, horn on my bike. It sounds like something, another creature from another planet. I press that horn because I couldn't get anybody's attention. They're not paying attention. They're on their phones when they should be paying attention. And they, I'd say, hey, hey, stop, and they wouldn't stop. So I got this little, and it makes the weirdest sound. They listen. The idea here is people's minds are obsessed with technology today, and few people take time to really think. Yes or no? We got a lot of people that, um, again, are so tied to technology, they don't take time to think through about life. Let me ask you a question. Do you take time every day just to sit? When I, you know, do leadership studies and stuff, they say reflection time is a really important thing. I've learned over the last number of years, I take reflection time regularly. That is time where I sit. I don't try to think about anything. I think about what me and and who Jesus is in me and what the Lord's done for me. But I just sit there and, and let the Lord talk to me by getting my mind quiet. How many think that could be valuable? Do you take time sometime every single day to get your mind quiet enough that the Lord can speak to you. Most people don't. They're constantly consumed by all the digital media available today from the time they get up until the time they go to bed. Can I challenge you? How about this week? What about if we practice taking some time every day? Turn off the to radio in your vehicle, turn off the MP3 player, turn off everything digital and just be quiet. While you, maybe it's while you commute to work. Maybe it's while you go visit your relatives uh, for Thanksgiving. Take some time every day to get quiet. Do you think it would make a difference? We might even hear God speak. What do you think? And so again, um, and so again, number three, the mind must be renewed for the spirit to be free. Number four, and I close with this, and the mind resists change. 
You have to force it to obey. Now, this is an interesting thought, but I want to read something to you from Romans chapter 8, verse 7. Um, it says, "For the this is a Holman Christian Standard Bible, the mindset of the flesh, that is a person who mind, is, whose mind is controlled by outward things, their body and outward things. For the mindset of the flesh is hostile to God, because it does not submit itself to God's law, for it's unable to do so. The Amplified Bible says this, the mind of the flesh with its sinful pursuits is actively hostile to God. Now that's an interesting idea. That apparatus that you have between your ears is hostile to God. And it wants to do what it wants to do, and it wants to continue to control your life. Yes or no? So here's the way the mind, the mind works. Uh, you know, the mind, the physical brain, um, uh, keeps all body functions stable. That is your brain without your thinking. It tells your heart to beat a certain rate uh, according to what kind of exercise you're doing. It tells your respiration, your lungs to breathe a certain number of times per minute according to how busy and active you are. It also, your mind regulates all of the organs of our physical body. It also regulates body temperature according to what you're doing. How many know the mind's a smart instrument God gave us? The physical brain is. But in the physical physical brain is the mind and with the mind we relate to everything around us and our minds our physical brain is accustomed to being in control of us all the way it's okay for it to be in control of these natural things in our physical body I mean how many would like to have to think heartbeat 81 beats a minute heartbeat 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 lungs lungs breathe Breathe X number, of, wouldn't that be ridiculous? Aren't you glad God made us the way he did? At the same time, our brains, our physical brain, our mind is so accustomed to regulating everything in life. It wants to regulate relationship. It wants to regulate what we think about ourselves and what we think about others. And sometimes it gets it wrong. How many know the way you think about yourself, the way you think about God, and the way you think about others, the truth is that is set in all of our lives by ages five or six. So our self-concept, whether we think we're wholesome and right and good, or we think we're just a rascal, all that's put in us at a young age. And generally speaking, it's going to stay that way until somebody, until something changes it. The way you think about women, the way you think about men, the way you think about relationships, the way we think about marriage, the way we think about authority figures, the way we, the way we think about money, the way we think about our health. All of that is regulated by what we receive when we're little children. And a lot of that, a lot of us, a lot of us still act out some of those things even though we're adults and we start having some huge problems and wonder why we treat this person that way. We're irresponsible in this thing. It's because there are thoughts that have been created by the things we've been around, yes or no? And furthermore, with the broken family uh, structure in America, it's easy to grow up with a skewed idea of how you should relate to the people around you and the world around you, yes or no? Then when you come to Jesus, guess what? There's an awakening on the inside. We find out that love is the motivation for everything in life. We're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And when we hear those things, our mind says, wait, wait, just a minute. That's okay unless that person does you wrong. And then you get even with them. And then you hold a chip on your shoulder. And then you, and then you don't talk to them. And then you slander them. And then you gossip and malign them with, no, no, no. That's what the mind says. That's not what God says. Again, the human mind is hostile to God. Yes or no? What does that mean? It wants to keep us living the way we've been living, even though Jesus has redeemed us and cleansed our sins. Yes or no? Absolutely true. It wants to keep controlling you. So here's the best way I can illustrate it. I was 30 years old. And I had probably been saved 30 years old. Let me see, 88. Yeah, about, I, was, I had been saved about 14 years or so at this time. 13 years. And uh, uh, I went back to South Carolina after, uh, after graduating from two Bible schools. And Susan and I had several kids. We went back and started a church in a small town in South Carolina. 
And then a phenomenon started happening to me. The church, you know, grew and, and, you know, things began to work out okay. But I started having these thoughts that, and so here I am preaching on Sunday morning. While I'm preaching on Sunday morning, this thought comes, as I'm looking at the crowd, I'm looking at the people's faces, my mind would tell me, see that person right there? While I'm talking, I'm preaching. I'm, I'm following my notes. But while I'm preaching, my mind would say, you see that person right there? They don't like you. You see that person right there? They wish you weren't pastor. You see that person right there? They think you're stupid. Now, ain't it crazy for your mind to say? But that's what my mind told me. See, when I was young, there are reasons I thought that way. This attitude that other people didn't like me or rejected me got put inside of me because of the things that I was around when I was a kid and the things that were spoken to me, the things that I, was, I said. I didn't realize it was there until I got up of age and then kind of got on my own, so to speak. But this rattled me, I mean, every Sunday, Sunday after Sunday, so that Monday mornings, I would get up and I would hear this thought you need just a quick you don't belong in ministry what you doing pastoring what you what, what, who do you think you are you're stupid these people think you're nuts they don't like you I said whoa 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 it happened Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday for several months I said God this is nuts I'm gonna go crazy thinking this way what is wrong with me every Monday I felt like a failure I hope you've never felt that way in all your life but I did and I couldn't figure out what it was and I found out that my mind was hijacking me and was hijacking my relationship with God. And I found this out. Your mind can tell you things that aren't true. And if you believe them, those untruths can continue to dominate your life. And I found out a lot of people never overcome these kinds of things. Now, you may not have had an environment where you were talked to the way I was and that rejection thought pattern came into your mind. might be other things, but the idea here is my mind was telling me things that weren't true. So here's what I did. I started calling people. I'd see this person, this person, this person. The church was fairly small. But I would start calling people on Monday mornings and I'd say, hey, this is Pastor Mitch, how you doing? Oh, good, good, good. Hey, appreciate you calling. What you call for? I just want to chat with you a minute. And I didn't tell them why. I called them to see if they really disliked me and really thought I was stupid or crazy or dumb and ignorant because that's what my mind was telling me. Not one of them, not one of them told me I was crazy and stupid and ignorant and dumb. Not one. And you know what I found out? My mind was lying to me. And the truth is it scared me because I thought, wait, 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 wait. If my mind can lie to me here, it can lie to me somewhere else. And y'all, I got after it. And I chased those thoughts right out of my mind. And that rejection stuff left. How many hear me? Same thing can happen. If you you can have a poverty mentality. Now how much money you make, you don't feel like you're worthy of having money. Or it can it can happen with, with sickness. You can feel like, well, you're not worthy of being well. That's your cross you've got to bear. Or it could be in relationships. Relationship after relationship doesn't work because your mindset, your mind is telling you that people don't like you. People don't love you. Be careful. Be careful of that person. You can't trust people, y'all. That stuff has to change. And it's called mind renewal. How many hear me? So I'm going to take you through a process. Does that make sense to anybody? Well, I'm telling you, it changed in me and changed my whole life. And I was just 30 years old when I got that truth that your mind is hostile to God and will tell you things that are absolutely not true. So I'm going to leave you with this. I actually have this in print on your way out. Make sure you get this sheet. I've got 30 symptoms of an unrenewed mind and then 30 symptoms of a renewed mind. And I don't have time. I'm just going to read it. It'll be on the screen, but I got to go fast. Can you listen fast? Because you're going to take this home and go think about it. If you have any of these symptoms, the mind needs to be renewed. Or if you have these other 30, you're doing good. Something's happened. God has changed how you think. We'll come back next time and I'll talk to you about how to get into the process of changing how you think so God can change your life. Does that sound interesting? So here we go. Here are 30 symptoms of an unrenewed mind. Again, I can't even discuss it. We're just gonna, we're just gonna read it. Little interest in the word. Little understanding of who you are in Christ. Uh, thinking only of the negatives in your life. 
Lack of joy, lack of personal freedom and liberty to be yourself, constantly dwelling on past thoughts, past feelings, past actions, lack of godly love and forgiveness, number eight, fear of openness and honesty, number nine, impure thinking and living, number 10, lack of humility and submission, stubbornness, weak faith in God and his word, more concerned with what people think than with what God thinks and wills. Motivated by feelings more than the word, fear of financial failure, fear of sickness, disease, obsession with symptoms, fear of God and others, fear of closeness and intimacy with others, fear of exposure or of letting people know who you really are, inferiority, loneliness, easily hurt and offended, overly sensitive, inability to accept criticism, fault finding, reading bad motives into what uh, others do, pessimistic Attitudes about life as a whole and in general. Sinful physical habits, self-pity, inability to give and receive love, constant critical demeanor towards your spouse if you're married, gossip, or looking for negative thoughts and traits in others. Whoa. Everybody's quiet. Like, oh my God, you're talking about me. <laughs> All of us have got some of that. Would you agree with that? Say, what does that tell you? That means there's work to be done. My renewal works this way. You never stop renewing your mind. We'll never get to the point that our minds are completely renewed and don't have to do that anymore. You know, you have to wash your car every week if you want a clean car. Uh, maybe every day. Because <laughs> it collects debris. And your mind is that same way. It collects debris constantly. And we're constantly in the process of changing what we think. Here are, here are symptoms of a renewed mind. I'm going to go through it quick again. Genuine love and concern for others. Joy, inward peace, patience with people, patience in circumstances, seeing the best in others, a sense of fulfillment personally, sense of acceptance with God, a lack of personal inferiority around people, uh, knowing your place in Christ, forgiveness, unconditional love, purity in thought and life. Ability to be comfortable revealing yourself to others. Ability to enjoy close relationships. Thoughts of health and healing. Knowing you are materially provided for. Optimism, even in tough circumstances. Believing the best of others. Faith in the word over feelings. Confidence in God. Proper sense of personal boundaries. Freedom to be open and honest. You treat others with kindness. A lack of worry. Because your life is committed to him and you know he's working everything out for your best. You use words that bless and heal. Honesty, you keep your word, you do your best and all you do. A thankful attitude even when life is hard. Woohoo! Doesn't that sound awesome? Man. So I've got this on a sheet because I knew I would get to this portion and I wouldn't have time. So here we are. So you take this home seriously. If you'll take it home uh, and, and just check the things that... that apply to you somebody first service said i didn't have to check anything all of them were me I mean, I don't know. <laughs> uh, on the symptoms of an unrenewed mind so take that home and do some homework with it. we may come back and, re- and and talk about some of these as we go through this series is that okay and uh how many know let's how about how about we work on working on what we think how many know you choose your thoughts i'll talk about that as i get into this series you choose this will be three or four weeks you choose. I choose what I think about. I don't allow my mind to tell me what to think. I tell my mind what to think. Now that's a different way of doing life, y'all. But if you start telling your mind what to think, instead of allowing your mind to tell you what your life is like, the better off you'll be. How many know the Bible says we have the mind of Christ? Stand up on your feet. Did you get something out of that?